Senator Ted Cruz, how are you, sir? Mark, I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Well, well, Senator Cruz, uh, you know, the media are a funny thing. Uh, the, the, the way they focus on certain things and they don't let go, and some of these things are just so so bizarre. Right now, um, the media has spent, what is today, Tuesday? Um, three days, I think, or maybe two, on Donald Trump and his comments about uh, limiting the uh, access to this country, importation, immigration of Muslims into this country for a, a, what he has said is a temporary period of time till we figure out what's going on. In other words, to ensure we have the processes in place. Yep. Um, shouldn't we at least have a discussion? I, I just had Andy McCarthy on my program, even in the Wall Street Journal editorial page. A lot of us have been saying this a long time. Shouldn't we at least have a discussion about Islam? We're not talking about the, the, the overwhelming majority of people who are Muslims. We're talking about a discussion about what it is that drives these people. Why can't we even talk about it? Uh, listen, you are absolutely right that we need to talk about the nature of the threat we're facing, and, and the need for that is underscored by the bizarre political correctness of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and every Democrat, it seems, in elected office, that they refuse even to say the words radical Islamic terrorism. I mean, you have Barack Obama goes on national television and says the Islamic State isn't Islamic. I mean, that's just nutty. I mean, that's not a reasonable foreign policy view. That is bizarre dissembling. As I've joked, there's a reason it's not called the Presbyterian state. And, right. and, and we need to acknowledge the threat of radical Islamic terrorism, the call to jihad. It, it, Islamism is a theological and political approach to mandating Sharia law, to waging jihad to either forcibly convert or to murder every infidel you can. And ISIS and Boko Haram and Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran and the radical Islamic terrorists have declared war on America, and the president refuses even to acknowledge it. So yes, we should be having this conversation, and, and we need to have a president who will do whatever is necessary to keep this nation safe from radical Islamic terrorism. And sadly, Barack Obama is unwilling to even begin that process. And then you watch the Praetorian Guard media. They ask all of you, all of your <laughs> candidates, what do you think about Trump's comment? It's not, what do you think about Obama as a failed commander-in-chief? Have you right. ever gotten that question from the liberal media? Uh, they can't even imagine that question. He, he is the, the, the hero of political correctness. Uh, they don't say radical Islamic terrorism either. Uh, you, you know, all of the media following the San Bernardino terrorist attack immediately turned, along with the Democrats, to what is the answer? confiscate people's guns, go after the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. You know, two days after the attack, I hosted a Second Amendment rally in Iowa. We did it at a shooting range, and, and the media were aghast. I mean, they, they, were, they were palpitating and trembling. How could you do such a thing? It's so insensitive. And, and, and listen, I laughed. I said, you know what? It's not my job to be sensitive to Islamic terrorists. You don't stop the bad guys by taking away our guns. You stop the bad guys by using our guns. And, and, and we will be safe against radical Islamic terrorism because we are a free people and we are an armed people who can protect ourselves and our families. That is a God-given right. And rather than having the President of the United States try to go after the constitutional rights of you and me and millions of law-abiding Americans, we need a President who will stand up and say, we will defeat radical Islamic terrorism, we will utterly destroy ISIS, any militant on the face of the planet, if you go and join ISIS, if you wage jihad against America, you're signing your death warrant. We need that clarity. And, and, and I think that has become the central issue, the most important issue in 2016, is getting a commander-in-chief who will defend this nation and keep us safe. Let me ask you this. Rand Paul recommended a, or proposed an amendment last week. Where only 10 of you voted in favor of it. Yep. That would have that would have had a pause, as they call it, yes. on immigration or refugees from 33 countries where terrorism is pervasive or where there's lawlessness afoot. That where we, we, you know, and and given the the incompetence and and the and the failure of the Obama administration in vetting people who are coming here, uh, what he says in this proposal is: look, we need some assurance. 
right. that this system is going to be fixed, and you have other requirements in there before people from these these this part of the world or these parts of uh, these regions can come into the United States. Only ten of you voted for it. Two guys posing as national security hawks who are running for president. Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio voted against it. What it seems to me utterly prudential. Why in the world would 90% of the United States Senate, including two self-proclaimed hawks, vote against it? Well, it, it wasn't surprising to see the two of them vote against it. I mean, remember, both Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio joined with Chuck Schumer and the other authors of the Gang of Eight Amnesty Bill in proposing giving Barack Obama massive new authority to admit refugees, including the authority to admit, admit tens of thousands of Syrian refugees, with no background checks. And, and, and you want to talk about a threat to national security, that's a profound threat to national security. As you know, I voted in favor of it, and I've introduced my own legislation that would impose a three-year moratorium on any refugees coming from any country where ISIS or al-Qaeda control substantial territory. And I am pressing Republican leadership, bring that bill up for a, a vote. In fact, I've got three pieces of legislation. The, the, th the moratorium on Syrian refugees. The second piece is the Expatriate Terrorist Act that provides that any American who travels abroad that joins ISIS, that wages jihad against America, that he or she loses their American citizenship. So we don't have ISIS terrorists using U.S. passports to come back here and murder Americans. And then the third piece I introduced today was legislation that gives governors the option to opt out of receiving refugees. I did a uh, press conference today with Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who is leading the fight nationally. Thirty governors are standing with Greg Abbott against allowing Syrian refugees into this country, who the head of the FBI, the Obama FBI, says they cannot vet to ensure they're not terrorists. In my view, Republican leadership, if we're serious about keeping this country safe, we ought to bring up and vote on all three of those bills, and we ought to put the Democrats on record. They ought to pass 100 to nothing. Because the first obligation of everybody, Republican or Democrat, should be to keep this nation safe. And yet, sadly, Barack Obama is so partisan, so driven by political correctness, that he refuses to do what's necessary to keep him safe. But it bothers me. I don't even know why Lindsey Graham's in this race. He seems to be there to sabotage conservatives. <laughs> he attacks you. He attacks uh, Ben Carson. He's attacked uh Rand Paul, he attacks Trump, he attacks... I mean, the guy's at 1%, 2%. He barely won the Republican primary, an open primary in South Carolina. He's all over TV, too. A guy at 1% or 2%, he gets a hell of a lot of face time. I, I really don't understand it. He supported taking out Gaddafi. Now we have a disaster in Libya. So did Rubio, as I recall. I'm just pointing yep. this out. So did McCain, as I recall. They seem to want to send ground troops everywhere. That's not the Reagan foreign policy. I lived the Reagan foreign policy. Yep. Did we send ground troops into the Soviet Union? I think we defeated the Soviet Union without a shot. But you have to be prudential, thoughtful. You've got to decide where and how to use the United States military, including to destroy the enemy. But you can't throw them into every civil war, can you? Uh, you are exactly right. Reagan believed, like you and I do, in peace through strength, that you're, you will defend this nation. But, but the, we don't send our sons and daughters into harm's way to get in the middle of civil wars where we don't have a dog in, in, in the outcome. I mean, it's worth remembering, in eight years, the biggest country Reagan ever invaded was Grenada. But at the same time, Iran released our hostages the day Reagan was sworn in. And when Gaddafi in Libya was committing acts of terrorism, Reagan bombed the living daylights out of them, killed Gaddafi's daughter, and it changed Gaddafi's behavior dramatically. Now, he didn't send our kids to go occupy Libya. He used force to keep our nation safe. And you're right, the Washington establishment, they have over and over again supported Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. They supported them when they toppled the government in Libya. They handed that country over to radical Islamic terrorists. They, they're supporting Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton when they want to topple the government in Syria. If they succeed in that, they'll hand that country over to radical Islamic terrorists. And you're not doing U.S. national security a favor when you topple a stable government and put ISIS or al-Qaeda or other people that are waging jihad against us in power. They did that in Egypt where they toppled Mubarak and put the Muslim Brotherhood, a terrorist organization, in power. We need a president 
focused on protecting America, keeping the American homeland safe, securing our border, and killing the terrorists before they kill us, not getting in the middle of battles between the Sunnis and Shias and trying to resolve religious civil wars. That ain't our problem. Stopping jihadists from killing us, that's our problem. But it, but it seems like this democracy project practiced yeah. by George W. Bush, practiced by uh, his... Uh, his uh, his political progeny, practiced by Obama to some extent, pushed by Hillary Clinton more aggressively. I mean, the fact is, wouldn't we better be better off America with the Shah of Iran? Wouldn't we have been better off with Mubarak? And now, of course, uh, Sisi, uh, uh, Gaddafi, you'll be accused of supporting Gaddafi now, you know, but it was the Bush administration that at the end supported Gaddafi and didn't want to take him down. Yeah. In other words, there's a reason why stability is... Uh, it is is really something that is important to the United States, our national security and the security of our allies. In each of those instances, whether Gaddafi, whether Mubarak, whether Assad, uh, whether the Shah, the dictators were killing the terrorists. We killed the dictators, and as a result, now the terrorists are killing us. And, and it doesn't make any sense. And you rightly pointed out the ideological forebears of this misguided foreign policy, and it goes back to Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter celebrated when the Shah of Iran fell, and, and it, they said it was you know, a democracy movement. It was like the, the, the Arab Spring. Well, having the Ayatollah Khomeini, or today the Ayatollah Khamenei, radical Islamic terrorists who call us the great Satan, who chant death to America, who want to kill us, that was much, much worse from the perspective of the safety and security of America. And we need a president who is focused on protecting this nation not engaged in a giant democracy project abroad that ignores U.S. national security interests. Finally, Senator, what do you make of the fact that it's obvious the last three or four weeks that Marco Rubio, who, who, who's a friend of mine, probably not anymore, uh, who I supported in the Republican primary when he was at 5% in Florida, and I supported you and I supported Mike Lee and others. Sure. What do you make, what do you make of the fact that he is aiming both barrels at you and cherry-picking uh, issues and these omnibus budgets to turn you into somebody you're not and to turn him into somebody he's not. What do you make of the fact that he seems to be focused almost exclusively on you? Well, you know, you, you wrote a, a terrific column in Conservative Review today that, 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 that takes this on, that, that i got to say it, it is remarkable even for you, even for the great one. It is a remarkable column. I commend it to everyone to read, and it, and, and it talks about that the need for honesty and debate and not engaging in Saul Alinsky type tactics of trying to lie and deceive. You know, the reason the Rubio campaign is doing this, they actually admitted the past couple of days ago in a New York Times article, which is they're very, very scared. And they're scared because conservatives are uniting behind our campaign. We're seeing that in Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, and Nevada, all across the country. We're seeing conservatives unite. And the Republican establishment, the Washington establishment, is attacking with both barrels. You know, one of the best signs of how well things are going. In the last two weeks, the Marco Rubio super PAC has begun attacking me. The Jeb Bush super PAC has begun attacking me. Barack Obama has attacked me twice. Hillary Clinton has attacked me twice. And a columnist for the New York Times wrote a column saying, anybody but Cruz. And, Mark, my reaction to all of that is thanks for the endorsement. Because mm -hmm. the establishment tells you who they're scared of, and they're scared of you and me and millions of conservatives who actually believe in the Constitution, who aren't just going to, 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 to keep going down the same failed path we're doing. And it is encouraging, so encouraging, that conservatives are coming together, uniting. That old Reagan coalition is coming together. And if conservatives unite, we win. And, and, and that is happening every, every day, more and more and more. And I promise you the attacks will only grow. But, you know, as they say in the military uh, context, if you're not taking flack, you're not over the target. And the establishment is going to shoot harder and harder and harder because their worst nightmare, as the New York Times put it, is a proven constitutional conservative who actually believes these principles instead of just saying it, hoping to fool the voters. All right, Senator Cruz, if people want to contact your campaign or support it, where do they go? It is tedcruz.org, tedcruz.org, tedcruz.org. And every time I go on your show, your listeners all over the country go to tedcruz.org. They sign on, they volunteer, they contribute. 
Your listeners are passionate fighters for liberty, and, and I am so grateful for your fearless voice at a time of peril. We are at a moment like Munich in 1938. Barack Obama is Neville Chamberlain promising, promising peace in our time, and we need the clarity of a Churchill to address our enemies, to defeat our enemies, and the American people are responding powerfully to the need for a strong leader who will keep this nation safe. Well, very well said. All right, Senator, God bless. We appreciate it. God bless. Take care.